heard about PCR biosystems? There's quite a buzz about us. Hop on over to our website to find out more. everybody, welcome to Pine of Science DNA Detectives. I'm your host, Ashley, and today you're going to be hearing from three scientists that currently work at the Francis Crick. Uh, so before we get started, I have a little bit of housekeeping. First, welcome. Thank you for coming. Thank you for showing up to this online event. Um, just so you know how uh, we're going to go, how we're going to play things out over the next hour or so, is the show format is going to have three scientific talks from three lovely different scientists. And then at the end of each of those talks, which is about 10 minutes long, so the first half an hour of the show, we're going to have a DNA questions panel. So if you have any questions about the talks or anything else, please put them in the comments box. And so you might be asking, what sort of questions am I really asking? Uh, or would you like us to ask in this sort of uh, comments box? Well, I divide them into serious, silly, and sci-fi. So serious is you're going to see these uh, scientists actually talk about their work. And so if you have any serious questions about what they're doing, please, please, please put them in the comment box. We'll try to get to as many as we can. Silly questions, well, when are you ever going to be um, have access to a panel of scientists that work directly with DNA. So you can ask for DNA fun facts. Or if you're like me and you watch a lot of sci-fi, you can ask, well, you see, I've been watching this show and they do this crazy thing with DNA. And is it possible? So along those lines, Siri, serious, silly, sci-fi, Please put any questions or comments in the comment box. We only ask that you be civil throughout this. And so, once again, I'm going to keep you a little bit longer. Before we get started, we're going to go over some overarching DNA basics. And what I mean by this is, in order to understand these talks, we want everyone to be focused on what DNA is and caught up to speed. So if you think about our bodies in general, we contain several complex organ systems that allow us to function properly. So you have the skeletal, the nervous, the blood system, the respiratory, the muscle, etc. All of these work together to make sure that your body can physically run. Now, if you look a little closer, each of these tissue systems or organ systems is built up of a tissue, which is really a bunch of different cells or the building blocks of this tissue that work together. So in this case, you're looking at potentially a zoom in on muscle, which will contain muscle cells, but also some fat cells and maybe some blood, veins that help uh, fuel the muscle, right? Now, if we zoom in farther on the cell itself, the functional unit of each of these systems is a cell. So muscle contains a lot of muscle cells. And so a cell distinguishes itself by uh, its DNA. And all of this DNA is packaged within the center of the cell in an organelle or a compartment called the nucleus. And so within that nucleus, you get a bunch of DNA. So DNA controls the cell, cells dictate what the tissue does, tissue makes up the big organ system. But what is DNA actually? So DNA scientifically is consists of a sequence of nucleotides. So what are nucleotides? They're essentially uh, different molecules that can chain together in a string. In your DNA, you have four different nucleotides, adenine, tyrosine, guanine, and cytosine. For, for all intents and purposes, we're just gonna call them A, T, G, and C. Now, the A, T, G, and C can string together in a long sequence, but it also actually matches with a pair sequence and twists to form this DNA helix that we see. So, another thing to know about DNA is that this sequence encodes for genes. And so what are genes? Genes are the things that regulate what a cell can do. So if you think about it, 
you have a bunch of different cells in your body. All of these cells have the same DNA. They have the same genes, but each of the cells is actually doing something different. So if you think of DNA as a cookbook or a cookbook of genes, the DNA itself is stable across all the cells. All the cells are reading from the same cookbook. However, the way that a cell decides what to do is by effectively turning on a gene or reading from it. And the way a cell does this is it starts to produce mRNA. mRNA is kind of like the recipe. So depending on what recipe the cell is reading from the cookbook, it's gonna make a different dinner. And so cells aren't just limited to reading one gene, they can actually read several. So you can have several types of mRNA expressed in one cell or uh, turned on by the genes in a cell. And each of these cells can, do, can turn on different genes and effectively make a different dinner or read different recipes. And similar to how the cookbook is passed down over generations, you might be able to riff on a recipe, add a little bit more cinnamon to grandma's pie. Cells can do the same thing. They can decide to change the mRNA much more easily than DNA is changed. So DNA is a bit stable, mRNA a little more flexible. All right, so to kind of review all of this, every cell in your body has the same DNA, DNA consists of a unique sequence of nucleotides, and this nucleotide sequence encodes for genes, and these genes are turned on when they produce mRNA. So now that we've kind of covered all of this, we're gonna ask what do scientists actually study about DNA? If we already know all of this, what is left to study? Well, you're gonna hear a talk that talks about how do we take all of this material for all of the genes in our body and squeeze it all into one nucleus for every single cell. You're gonna hear a talk about what happens when things go wrong. What happens if your DNA breaks? And then you're gonna hear a final talk about how do these recipes change over time? Meaning, how does the mRNA change as we evolve as a species? So, um, first off, I'm gonna pass it to Teresa, and she's gonna hit this, this first question. How do we squeeze all of the DNA material that encodes every gene in our body, which is a lot of genes, into a teeny tiny nucleus? And this is an interesting thing because one, there are a lot of theories, but we don't actually know how it happens. And Teresa approaches it from a slightly different point of view where she uses mathematics and computer science to try and figure this out. And with that, I'm gonna hand it off to Teresa. Now, thank you for a great introduction, Ashley. Uh, so hello, I'm Teresa. And as Ashley mentioned, I will be talking about chromatin spaghetti and how we can squeeze the chromatin into a tiny nucleus. So you're right now probably asking yourself a question, okay, why are we talking about chromatin spaghetti? What is going on? So don't worry, I will try to do my best to explain everything to you by the end of the talk so that you understand why it is really important for scientists to understand the rule of chromatin spaghetti. So as Ashley mentioned at the beginning, we as human beings consist of trillions of different cells and they differ in shape, size, number, and most importantly, in their function. But what they do have in common, all of the cells, is their DNA, a molecule that is inside of the cell, as actually mentioned at the beginning. And what is super interesting about this DNA molecule is that it carries out instructions for each of the cell, and it dictates them what to do, when to do that, how to behave, what the shape, size to be, when it should divide. So in my talk, I won't be focusing only on the pure naked DNA. I will be talking about the complex. So DNA is a very social molecule. It loves to be surrounded by their friends. And by their friends, I mean a certain molecules that we name proteins. So DNA together with their friends, their buddies, called a complex, a team. And a lot of teams together, we call, as scientists, we call them chromatin, chromatin fiber. So my talk will be focusing about this of turning around this chromatin fiber and its 3D, three-dimensional organization in a space. So we as a scientist, we love to look at uh, the scientific problems in metaphor. So let's imagine um, 
you eating a spaghetti. You have your spaghetti in a plate. So most of the time, I don't know about you, but in my case, it's always a huge mess. It's like a large bundle, completely entangled, knotted, just one big mess. And we really love to look at our chromatin inside ourselves as this chromatin spaghetti. But it's not actually really right that we always have this chromatin spaghetti in our cells. Sometimes what can happen is like a miracle. We get from this messed up spaghetti into a densely packed, well-defined, X-shaped, tiny chromosome inside. So in my talk today, I will try to answer two major questions. First of all, when this thing happen? When can we get from this messed up chromatin spaghetti into densely packed tiny X-shaped chromosome? And secondly, most importantly, how can we do that? So for the first question, when? The answer is pretty simple and it's been known for many decades. So when our cells want to divide into two, they need to go through a series of events that we call cell cycle as you can see here in the picture. So cell cycle, there are many events, and when cell progresses throughout the cell cycle, it changes. You can see or you can imagine the cell cycle as an analogy to a changing seasons throughout the year. So at the beginning of the cell cycle, let's say in spring, as you wish, uh, the, uh, the chromatin inside the cell is just like the chromatin spaghetti, messed up, entangled, just one big mess. But as the cell progresses throughout the cell cycle, it changes. So that's the shape and the structure of the chromatin. And just before the cell splits into two, this messed up chromatin turns by, <laughs> by some surprise or miraculously turns into this well-defined X-shaped chromosome. So the answer to this question, when, is just at the beginning or just before the two cell splits into two. So just to give you an idea of how complex this problem is and how actually amazing it is that we can get from chromatin spaghetti into a densely packed X-shaped tiny chromosome, let's have a look at the London Underground. So if you imagine that we took the whole London Underground, the whole map, the whole routes, and we were trying to squeeze it into a small suitcase, I bet that no one can do that. It's just... It's just not possible. But actually, ourselves are able to squeeze that type of biological London underground into a tiny chromosome. So how can we actually do that? And going back to our analogy with chromatin spaghetti or just eating our own spaghetti, I don't know about you, but when I am eating spaghetti, I need to use a fork. Otherwise, I won't be able to eat anything. And the purpose of the fork is that you actually fold the spaghetti onto it. So we had this idea of, do we have some sort of biological fork in ourselves that, el or that allows the cell to kind of work up with this messed up chromatin and fold it into a densely packed chromosome? So the answer to this question of whether we have a biological fork is no. We do not have a biological fork, but what we do have inside our cells is a biological ring that we call condensin or cohesin. And this biological ring, surprisingly, has the ability to turn the messed up condensin into a nicely organized, dense X-shaped chromosome. But it's just not ring alone yeah the ring has a fellowship of the ring like a faithful friends supporting elements that help the ring to fulfill its function so just to wrap up we were trying to explain what the chromatin actually is so the dna alone plus their friends that we call proteins together they form the chromatin fiber this is what we're interested in and this chromatin fiber tends to be pretty messed up but not all of us sometimes it can form this densely packed X-shaped chromosome, as I was mentioning here. And we also were trying to explain that this change happens just before a cell splits into two. And also we mentioned that behind this change is this biological ring that we call condensing and cohesing. But what we still don't know is how can we actually do that? What's the function of this ring? How does this ring do this? So we, as a computational scientist, what we love to do is that we create hypotheses, our models of how biology actually works. 
And today I will be talking about two models that could explain the role and function of this biological ring in our cells. So the first model is called loop model. And it's based on the fact that our biological ring, called condensin or cohesin, can jump off or on the chromatin chain. Once it's on the chromatin chain, it starts to walk along the chromatin chain in such a way that it pulls the chain inside of its ring and thus forming a loop. And if you imagine a sequence of these events, then we start to form a lot of loops, larger and larger loops. And when we stack all the loops on the top of each other, we are then able to form this nicely densely packed X-shaped chromosome. A second model that I would like to describe is called a clustering model. And similarly to the previous loop model, it's again based on the fact that our biological ring, condensin or cohesin, can jump on or off the chromatin chain. Once it's on, unlike in the previous model, it just sits on the chromatin chain. It doesn't move. But what it does instead is that it starts to look and search for a neighboring ring. And once a neighboring ring is found, they two just hug each other. They, they are so happy that they start to interact with each other. And when there are more and more rings in 3D and they localize in the same space, all of them hug each other. It's just like as if you have a football team and everyone is hugging each other after the end of the match when they win. So by hugging each other, they form a cluster. That's why we call this model a clustering model. So now when we have our model, we just want to somehow explore whether it's actually possible. We want to somehow simulate this model. This is what we do as a computational scientist. But how can we do that? So first of all, as I have mentioned, we sit down and we try to come up with a model, those that I described just previously, or a hypothesis. We write down a lot of notes. We think about whether it is really like biologically possible, whether ourselves could actually do that. Secondly, what we do is that we introduce the physics. We try to think about all the forces or the biophysics that happens in the cell and that could contribute to the models that we develop and what type of forces could be exerted so that it can actually make sense biologically. Third, we use maths to kind of describe the language of the physics or vice versa to define the physics. And when we have these three steps, what we do is that we take all this information and we convert it into a computer language that then generates a computer program. And what this computer program does is that it allows us to simulate both of the models that we're interested in. And when we have the simulations and all the results, what we do is that we analyze them and do a lot of stats. And when we have all this data available, what happens is that we have much more questions than when we started. So effectively, we go back to number one. We sit down, we think about it, we make a lot of notes, and we repeat this whole process many, many, many times. So finally, when we have some results that we hope we understand and we're happy with, we go back to our colleagues in vet lab and we suggest them experiments so that we can actually verify which of these two models uh, is more plausible or makes more sense in terms of biology. And just to give you an idea of how our simulations look like, I will now play a short videos of both of them. So, this video was about the loop model. The orange bits represent the loops and the blue bits represent the biological rings. As you can see, these biological rings make a really nice ring backbone. So the second video corresponds to the clustering model and the bluish ones, the blue clusters are actually the ring clusters and the gray kind of lines represent the chromatin, the free chromatin. So right now you're probably asking yourself a question, okay, this is all weird or cool or whatever, but why should I care about some biological ring? Why should I even care about some messed up uh, chromatin spaghetti? Well, as it appears in our life, things don't always go the way we would expect them to or we would love them to. And so does uh, this applies to our biological ring condensing cohesin. So in order to 
allow this biological ring to perform its function and squeeze chromatin into a tiny chromosome, we really need uh, to have a ring shape, this kind of a circular shape. But what sometimes happens is that it's not just a, a, a circular shape, but it can be a little bit messed up, just like this paper. So what then happens is that our cells recognize that it's this kind of crumpled paper, not this nice thing, and they just throw it into a bin, a biological bin. And what happens with time is that this biological bin keeps on building and building and building. And this is a big alert for ourselves. And all this thing can actually lead to a condition that we call cohesinopathy. We as an adults may not recognize that, but babies with cohesinopathy can suffer a lot of deformabilities. They can be born without toes, fingers, nails, and they need a lot of extra care. So the reason why we're trying to understand the biological ring and its activity on chromatin is that we're more likely to trigger the events when things don't go the way we would expect. And we're more likely to find the proper treatment for cohesinopathy so that we allow those babies to have a better life. And with this, I would like to thank you for your attention. And I will be back at the end of the Pint of Science to discuss your questions. Thank you, Teresa. So to recap for everyone that's following, you have DNA that forms these chromatin strings. And what Teresa and her fellow scientists are looking at is how does that string or plate of spaghetti then wrap tightly into what we call chromosomes, which were those X shapes. And then when this goes wrong, you can have all of these cohesinopathies. And so specifically, she looks at this ring and how it affects that. Okay, so as a reminder, please, please, please put any questions that you might have for Teresa in the comments box. We'll try to get to them later. But now um, we're going to hear from our next speaker, Alex. So Alex, she looks into what happens when things go wrong with DNA. So we've just heard about how we package our DNA into the nucleus, but what happens if that DNA is broken? And so Alex and her uh, scientists are going to tell us about this. Over to you, Alex. Thank you very much. So I hope everyone hears me. And as you have already heard, I'm Alex and I'm going to talk about Her Majesty DNA and how we sense if, the, if there is a problem happening in the DNA. So as you have already heard, our cells are really miniature factories that are the building blocks of all the bodies. And the important part of the cell or the mastermind, the control deck of the cell is the nucleus. And as you have nicely seen uh, from uh, Teresa, is that the nucleus is composed of the DNA and at a certain stage of the cell cycle, the DNA is organized in these very nicely shaped chromosomes. And the DNA is actually the cellular software. So the cellular software is encoded in this molecule. But then what happens if this molecule is somehow bugged? So if there is a problem in the cellular software, there can be many consequences of that. One of them can be accelerated aging, another can lead to cancer or some other diseases. So obviously, as every majesty, the DNA really needs a guard, a protection. And what is that protection is what my and some other labs around the world are studying. So I will quickly guide you through the process of how problems and um, protection for the DNA uh, is um, executed. So I will do that through a very simple metaphor. And as Teresa mentioned, we love metaphors. So I just want you to imagine um, a simple um, moment where someone had a cut. So a cut is actually a signal that something is happening that is really unusual. Um, and normally, if you were small and your mom and dad might be next to you, they would be like, oh my god, something is happening and we need to do something. And there is a problem. So they're really the first uh, sensors that are coming to uh, the place where there is a problem. But then if there is a, a bit of a more serious problem, they might need to call the ambulance. So the ambulance is actually something that we call an amplifier of the initial signal. 
Uh, and also it transmits this message to a place where uh, help can be delivered to you. So you can imagine, so it has a two way function. One is to really amplify the scream. So you have the tinu, ninu, ninu constant screaming. And then another function is to actually bring that signal to a place where it can be helped. And at the end, we have the effectors or the doctors who are basically the people who will eventually reseal the cut. And this whole metaphor really applies to the cell. So if we look at what happens in the cell, so when there is a break in the DNA, there is something which we call protein complex and proteins are these cellular machines that are actually all uh, that are executing all the important functions in the cells. So there is this really important protein complex that jumps at the place of the break. That protein complex is actually the one that picks up the phone and calls the ambulance, which is uh, this amplifier protein inside the cell. And then at the end of this process, there are several possible fates. One is the cell just stops dividing until the problem is fixed. The other one is that the problem is easily fixed and nothing needs to happen. Or if none of this is possible, the cell might eventually die. So until now, I have told you two important things. One is that the cellular software is encoded in the molecule of DNA and protecting that software is of paramount uh, importance. And we have proteins that are uh, doing uh, and executing that kind of function. But how can we then maybe use this as a tool to uh, actually uh, to actually help uh, in uh, uh, in when in spaces when there is a problem inside the cell? So if you uh, have a look at the normal cell, a normal cell can have um, gene A and B completely normal and active. And if we design a chemical compound that will inactivate gene A or a drug, the cell will be able to survive because there are some genes that have specific functions only at specific stage and the cell without that gene is not so much affected. But then for example, a tumor cell can, can have a loss or a defective gene B, but if at the same time we remove both gene A with the chemical compound while the, the gene B is also gone, what happens is that we can specifically kill the tumor cell. So a lot of labs around the world are really looking for this Achilles heel of the tumor cells. And one interesting example of that, which I, I, uh, I believe some of you can have heard is uh, the Angelina effect or uh, the BRCA1 uh, and 2 mutations in breast cancers. So these proteins are actually proteins that are important for the sensing part after damage has happened. And in normal cells, if we remove a specific protein, uh, the, these cells can survive. But in tumor cells, if we remove that protein, these cells are then sensitive and can be specifically killed. So this uh, is very nicely and for the first time brought to clinic. Uh, and I invite you to go to the Science Museum in London to actually see this experiment uh, in real life. Uh, and it, the, the drug has been developed in the UK and it's called Olaparib. And you can clearly see here that normal cells treated with this drug are surviving nicely. But then when you add this drug to cells that don't have this specific gene, they uh, are now specifically killed. So with this, we as scientists are really searching for the specific Achilles heels in the tumor cells in order to enhance the capabilities of targeted tumor therapies. And with this, I would just want to thank you and to thank the group I'm working in. Uh, that's the uh, group of the Professor Simon Bolton in this wonderful place of the Francis Crick. So I'll meet you later in the Q&A. Thank you so, so much, Alex. That was fantastic. So kind of to recap what Alex said, uh, you have DNA and 
in that DNA, it's very important that the code isn't bugged, right? And so we have this whole system that's set up to protect that code. And because of that, if there is a problem with the code, your cell has a couple options, one of which is death, one of which is repair. And so what scientists are doing is they're essentially taking uh, cells in cancer, essentially, that might have a mutation in a gene where they might choose to survive or repair DNA, and then adding in a drug to say, no, 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 let's go down the death route instead. And it's because of this that we can develop further cancer therapies and look at different uh, DNA mutations. The BRCA gene was just one of them. Okay, so now we're going to hear from our final speaker, Yerne, who is going to tell us um, about what happens beyond DNA. So if you remember at the beginning, I talked about how the way we turn on and off genes is by expressing this mRNA, or essentially reading the cookbook and writing down the recipe or using a recipe. And so Yerne is going to tell us how this affects us as humans and then how it affects our development in evolutionary time. Take it away, Yerne. Hi everyone. So the title of my talk is The Life's Cookbook and its Recipes. And I'm really interested in uh, the your name, part. sorry, can you we can't see your screen right now. Can you share your screen quickly? Oh, sorry. I thought I was sharing. No worries. Just a moment. Um share. Sorry for that. Here we go. All right, Looking perfect. Good? Yep, we can see right, it. Here we go. So um, I'm an RNA biologist. So while this is a session about DNA, I really want to show how a molecule that is chemically a cousin of DNA gives a lot of fluidity to the system of expressing the genes. So we're talking about the DNA as the cookbook. So we could talk about RNA as the cook that is making the recipes for the molecules of life. And you can see here in this simple diagram that we have various types of RNAs, but the one that I'll talk about most here is the RNAs called mRNAs, which contain the information for the proteins. And proteins are doing most of the jobs in the cells. So these mRNAs are quite important. So protein coding genes will be the focus for this talk. And you can see here that a gene is first dutifully transcribed into an RNA molecule in a way that it fully preserves the sequence that was in the DNA. And so this is then just a simple linear uh, molecule made of many letters. Um, but what is quite interesting with the RNA is that not all of that molecule will actually end up in the final recipe. We will have bits that are called exons that need to be cut and paste together in order to make the final product, the introns that are removed. And if you remember Alexandra's talk, DNA cuts are quite dangerous, so we want to avoid them. So RNA has this advantage that this cut and paste process is actually part of the whole expression uh, kind of pipeline, and most genes go through that process all the time. So it gives that kind of flexibility to the system. And what is quite interesting is that also you can produce alternative variants. From the same gene, you can pr produce various mRNAs, various recipes, depending on which exon is being chosen. So the process is not always uniform, and most genes will have variety at this stage. And as you remember, what Ashley introduced, we express genes in different ways across cells. And this uh, variety here is very context dependent. It will depend on the type of the cell and the age and the disease state, and uh, really allows the cells to recognize the context, the environmental state, and the signaling they are in. Now, what I find quite interesting is that only about 1% of our genome actually contains that sequence that ends up in the recipes. So the bits that are called the exons. So if you just imagine here, most of this apple is really what we call non-coding. It doesn't code for proteins. So what is that doing? What is this good for? And one of the main 
purposes of that is to define when and how those recipes are being made. And Theresa talked very much about how the structure of the DNA can influence this process. Um, now, what I'm very interested here, and I'll talk about in this talk, uh, is the fact that a large proportion of the genome is derived from repetitive elements. Now, depending on how you assign them, you might talk about half of the genome, but this particular study actually suggested that more than three quarters of the genome is made of some form of repetitive sequences. And you would think about repetitive sequences generally being less functional. That's what's generally believed because they somehow just repeat themselves. And a very common source of repetitive sequences is something called retrotransposons. Um, this might originate to about a third of the genome. And this you would consider a very simple variant of, kind of viral-like propagation. HIV gene uh, is, for example, a retrovirus that goes between DNA and RNA. This is a very simple version of this process where you have a retrotransposon in the DNA that can transcribe itself into the RNA and then has a way to insert that back into the DNA. And it can propagate itself along the DNA. Now, what's very important is that 99% of these retrotransposons in our genome are fossils, so they are not able to copy themselves anymore. They are remnants of past integrations. And one that we have been studying quite a lot is a family called ALUS that contribute about 10% of human genome. We have over a million of those copies and they are specific for primates. So most of them have been copying themselves in an ancestor of primates in the very kind of origin branches of primates. Um, but they, a few of them still keep copying themselves. So you can see a few hundred are actually human specific. But importantly, vast majority of those are fossils. So they have accumulated mutations over the age and have accumulated lots of variation. They're not actively copying, but they're just starting to diverge from each other and creating lots of um, possibilities within their sequences. And one of the possibilities that they arise is that they can themselves carry within themselves a sequence for an axon. We found together with these colleagues, just to highlight the fact how collaborative the science work always is, um, that the variation within ALUS within thousands of sequences leads to creation of new axons. We call this ALU axonization. And a lot of those axons have actually already started to contribute to new functions in human tissues and have contributed to our evolution. And if you look at tomorrow's issue of Nature, you will see a study where we found how an exon from a family of mammalian uh, transpose, uh, mammalian repetitive elements protects us from Alzheimer's and dementia. So they do have important functions, um, but they also could be dangerous because we have so many. As I mentioned, we have just the ALU elements, we have a million of those elements. So we discovered a system that actually masks those axons. So most of these axons that are hidden within these elements are masked and made invisible to the cells. And that ensures that our genes are not perturbed and they create functional proteins. And this mask is devised and based on a very, very simple word that is present within this ALU element. It's a word made of a single letter, just a sequence of a letter that we call U. So you have to have at least eight of those U's in a row and you can attach this mask to the element and hide them. Um, what we found is that mutations within this simple word can actually disrupt that mask, they release it, and that will actually initiate splicing in what we call this cut and paste process. And it will create aberrations within this transcript because these axons have not evolved yet to be functional and the recipes that are now made from these genes will generally perturb the genes and will create proteins that can't do their functions, which can lead to a broad variety of diseases because we have so many of these axons. Um, now, we see that these mutations can unmask the axons to, to change the recipe, but I mentioned that this is also important for evolution. The same process, if it's given enough time, will actually accumulate enough mutations within the axons themselves to create new functionalities, new proteins, and new functions. 
And um, in a way to summarize that, we see that genome is full of potential for making new recipes. We have thousands and thousands of new potential axons. Perhaps we have more potential axons than we have real axons in the genome. But most of those axons need to be masked in some way. And I've just mentioned one mechanism, but we have many, many different ways to do that. And it's been discovered by many different people. I give you some links here to various um, writings. I've myself written in some kind of a conversation piece around this topic. And of course, we are all dealing a lot on the topic of masks right now, so it fits the, the topic. Now, what we studied also is how this unmasking happens. And we were able to trace the unmasking process by looking at how long have these ALU elements been present in our genome. We can, we can do by just comparing the genomes across various primate species. And if we see an element link in common between, for example, a human and a new world monkey, which is having quite a distant evolutionary ancestor, we can presume that this element must have been in the genome for quite a long time, for many, many millions of years. But if an element is shared only with gorillas, for example, so the old world monkeys, then it's only a few million years old. And what we find basically that the younger elements have this a uridine rich words that are very, very long, whereas the ones that have been around for a long time have shorter uridine rich elements, which means that they are much less masked. And indeed, we also found that the ones that give rise to axons that contribute to the recipes in our cells are the ones that have been around for a longer amount of time. And this was done by this group of people. Um, so we would really like to summarize this as kind of a dimmer switch dimmer control for evolution that gives the capacity of evolution to gradually create new innovations and new functions. So the function is already there, the axons are there from the very start, but they don't emerge right away. They don't immediately become recipes. This uridine stretch has to gradually shorten in order for the axons to start giving rise to, to the recipes of our molecules in our cells. And we find that as kind of a nice toolbox for evolution. So we talked about the fact that we have this huge apple, which doesn't necessarily make axons, but it has a huge potential for making new recipes. And this gradual process of unmasking releases this potential of making the new recipes. And I find that very nice kind of a principle to think about also in the way that we communicate in our culture, in our language because the way we use our language very much depends on the context. Sometimes we will chat about something to our friend that we would not talk about publicly. The way a politician speaks might be different to the way I speak here in a kind of science presentation and so forth. So in a way how the genome has this vast resource of potential that then is unlocked in a gradual manner, in a very nuanced way, teaches us the importance of context in a way that we use information. And to conclude, I would like to touch on this interesting study led by Chris, Maria, and Warren, where we found that the longest genes in our cells are the ones expressed in neurons, which are the cells of the brain. So they have these longest pieces that are actually cut out and removed. But we also found that these are the pieces that contain this kind of hidden potential and new axons. They have lots of cryptic axons that you can actually detect in very, very low levels in the brain. So actually, this axons are present, they are kind of exploring the space of opportunities. And we think that there's a lot more to understand about this process. We don't really know why this is the case. So lots of unknowns really, and um, I'm looking forward to inspiration from other people and anyone on this talk and feel free to come back for any ideas. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Yone. So kind of to summarize what Yone said is that you have your cookbook and you have your recipes. And the cookbook kind of has some filler space between each of the genes or each of the recipes. And what we, a lot of this is what we call repetitive elements, meaning a lot of G's in a row or a lot of A's in a row. And some of these have the ability to hop around and some might even insert themselves into a recipe. And that can actually change how that recipe is made or expressed over time, which will eventually lead to either disease or getting a new skill or, or our evolution in general. So really, really fascinating talk, Yerne.
Okay, so I'm going to invite all of the other speakers back, and we're going to enter a bit of a Q&A session. So um, first, kind of just to get the ball rolling, I want to remind anyone watching, please, please, please put your questions in the chat box, but just an easy one that we got earlier. Um, so from the audience, do flora and fauna have different base nucleotides? So the, the sequence of letters that I talked about the, at the beginning, uh, can anyone answer that? I'm gonna pick on you if you don't volunteer. So. <laughs> Well, yeah, if no one is interested, I can start and then I can gradually pass it on others. So as far as I understand, so the A, C, G, D, the tiny bits, like really the nucleotides, as actually mentioned at the beginning, the really the, the tiny ones that then form the sequences of the DNA, those are the same in all the species. But of course, how these A, C, G, D are kind of um, in the form of a sequence, this does differ not only fauna and flora, but species by species, yeah. And also it can even differ, um, let's say, between humans, yeah, because this is the evolution and this is also what could create uh, a source of mutation if the sequence is not maintained. So is this kind of satisfying to answer the question or does anyone want to, you know, follow up on that? <laughs> So I think that that was a perfect answer. And it kind of leads into another audience question, um, which is, so the sequence has to be maintained kind of as Alex was talking about. And so we all use the same things to write the sequence, but it's slightly different between people, between species, between flora and fauna, et cetera. Um, so can damaged or mutated DNA be fixed? And I think this is kind of for Alex, right? Yeah, that is an interesting question. Uh, yes and no. <laughs> uh, we do have some gene therapy and gene therapy is actually a field that is in development. So uh, we are working on being able to fix problems in the DNA, but obviously there is a limitation to every tool we have in our palette. So some uh, some problems can be fixed when we are adults by using, if they're localized to a specific tissue, and then the gene therapy is a very good tool. But then in other cases where the changes are bigger, so bigger ch chunks of DNA are damaged, it can be quite challenging. So we are not there yet. So long-winded answer for a yes and no kind of question. <laughs> So kind of along those lines, we have, we have some really great uh, questions. So um, there are many conditions that we kind of know a little bit about the genes. So Down syndrome, for example. Um, and are we moving towards being able to understand uh, more of these at a DNA level and will this help us in a way, and so a more, I guess, general way to put this is, are we at the stage where we can start predicting diseases from genes? Um, and is there a way that we can start fixing them? So you've kind of gotten into maybe a little bit about that. And I'm gonna toss this one at your name since you've been quiet. Okay, <laughs> it's a tough one. So on one hand, the Down syndrome, we're losing a whole chromosome. So are duplicating the chromosome in this case, actually. So um we are learning from what the genes on this chromosome are doing and sometimes there there is a group in the creek which actually finds that they can replicate some of the symptoms of down syndrome by just duplicating specific genes in there so you don't need to duplicate the whole chromosome so there might be ways to then ameliorate the problems by just decreasing the expression of those specific genes and there are ways to do that nowadays you can try to control gene expression with various systems um, or just kind of their activities or so forth. So we're certainly, you know, making huge progress in terms of understanding how to deal with diseases where we know the cause. But on the other hand, there's this question, can we predict diseases just by sequencing everyone, even though we don't necessarily know what is that specific mutation leading to specific diseases, but just somehow collecting all the sequences, we're using more and more artificial intelligence to do that. And so I think really the computational innovations are very much going hand in hand with molecular biology these days. And it's working progress, 
but I would say, you know, from the talk I gave, the fact is that everything is in constant flux and the variety is the norm in populations. So I can imagine this will always be a challenge. I would imagine we'll never fully solve it. Okay, and so now along those lines for a slightly more sci-fi question, since we're saying our, our, our DNA is kind of constantly in flux, um, audience question, so does our DNA change over time? We've kind of said yes, but to the point of if you committed a crime when you were much younger um, and police have that DNA, would you be able to be caught when you're older since your DNA supposedly changes over time? Um, anyone want to go at that one? I want this right. one. <laughs> go ahead, Alex. <laughs> I, yeah, I really like this question. So uh, I always have this short and long answer. So short one, uh, we can be caught. <laughs> yes, we can be caught. <laughs> uh, long one, uh, there are windows uh, of changes that are changes within a lifetime and changes across longer time scales of evolution and within a lifetime there are things that can change but for example in the specific case of what people are measuring when they're looking at the pattern when they're like doing the crime investigations they're picking specifically parts of the genome that are stable over long periods of time so therefore they can detect that it was you because these things won't change, although there are some small pieces of the genome which can change during your lifetime. And I guess Yerne can have additions to this. Maybe. Yeah, sorry, just to kind of like jump in, why why do some pieces not change and others do? Mm. That's, a, that's as well a good point. So uh, some of this has to do with the sequence. So uh, there are some parts of the genome which uh, your name may be mentioned a little bit, but they're called repetitive sequences. And uh, so repetitive means that there is a chunk of the sequence that just repeats over and over and over again. And uh, for example, the ends of the human chromosomes, uh, which are called telomeres, they have a lot of these repetitive sequences, which they are shortening over time. So they are not necessarily changing much in sequence, but they are changing in length. So there, and then these sequences are also very unstable because they can form specific structures and they can organize in different ways. And therefore they can be also cut out by specific enzymes. So there's a lot of like, uh, a lot of dynamics happening in the cells. So therefore these sequences are extremely prone to changing over a lifetime. And then the more stable ones are basically the ones that have a more varied sequence and uh, are also more protected because those are the ones which uh, really need to keep stable in order for us to keep our shape and form, basically. Right. Uh, so uh, one maybe for Teresa, kind of along along this line of like, keep maybe keeping shape and form, but so, so currently there's so much pressure to jam pack everything in the nucleus. All of our cells keep their shape and form by throwing this DNA into the nucleus and packing it really tight, which gets to your uh, topic. But why do you think we haven't evolved to throw away this junk DNA? Yes, so this is a really excellent question. So, so far we were like talking about uh, the instruction in our DNA, the genes, and the RNA was talking about uh, the other bits of the genome. And But what we haven't mentioned is that even the other bits, those that are not genes, have their specific functions, different functions and supporting functions. And from my perspective, I basically know that we need a 3D shape, we need a 3D organization of the whole genome. And without this junk DNA, this junk stuff, we would not be able to get the 3D shape that's necessary for the genes, the coding regions to communicate with each other. So we really does need certain amount of the junk just because we call it junk, it doesn't mean it has no function at all. So this is a simple answer and there can be also, of course, a more complex <laughs> answer, but I will just stay with this one. And Yerne, do you have any any thoughts to add or is that? Maybe to, just to say there is a bit of a trade-off for sure. And there are organisms, even vertebrate organisms that have extremely compressed genomes that have got three, most of the you know, supposed junk, such as let's say fugu fish or 
deep sea fishes. Mainly, it seems the organisms that live in extremely stable environments. Um, whereas, for example, uh, corn, I believe, is a plant that has a huge genome and has duplicated everything massively and has been under massive pressure for evolution recently by us, right? We're pushing corn so much. So it might have to do a little bit with the evolutionary pressure for how much adaptation there is needed and this extra space gives you more possibility maybe. But I think it's very hard to prove it, right? It's a bit of a chicken and egg problem. Okay, so that, that kind of leads me into uh, uh, like a bigger question of the night, uh, thinking of evolutionary pressure. Why, why do you think that humans are so much more evolved than other species if we all share like the same, you could say toolkit, the sequences uh, to work with when it comes to DNA? Anyone want to take that one? Well, maybe I can start. Okay, and go ahead. And pass it on others to have their own opinion and thoughts. So this is a very interesting question, almost like a philosophical one. And I think it's best to discuss this with evolutionary biologists rather than, you know, uh, uh, genome bible biologists. But I will try to do my best to express my opinion. So first of all, let's imagine that, you know, by evolved, we probably think that we are so evolved that we are able to talk via Zoom, Skype, uh, streaming art on YouTube, that we're using phones and computers and so on. We're using machine learning, but it doesn't necessarily mean uh, we are that much evolved compared to, for instance, a coral or ant or a fish. So evolution is not like necessarily a progression. And uh, that specific species evolves so that it can perform its task within that specific environment, yeah. And because we are changing our own environment, we have to evolve. So we had to evolve to this extent. But for instance, a small tiny ant has evolved to that end because it's perfect for them, yeah. So I would be very careful about phrasing the fact that we are really like on the top of the evolutionary tree. So this is my thought of that, that we have evolved based on what we need as human beings. And if anyone else wants to follow up on that, just please go ahead. So are you saying we're not perfect yet? We have to keep going. <laughs> no one is. <laughs> Any other thoughts? Maybe I would just add that, you know, maybe my talk shouldn't be taken too human centric. Like I presented it a little bit like that around primates. But we actually did a similar analysis for rodents and we saw exactly the same. So this kind of gradual unmasking of repetitive elements happened there also. And I think really everything we talk about is very general. We, I don't think we've identified so far anything in terms of molecular biology that would be unique to humans. And there's no particular kind of conceptual innovation there. And it's just tinkering around the edges that somehow, you know, humans were on there as you say, adaptation to our own environment that we are creating, which is more cultural maybe than biological. Okay, well, thank you guys. Kind of just to like wrap up this session, our main points were that we, we share DNA or the toolkit of DNA with a lot of other species. And similar to many other species, we have different ways of manipulating it, fixing it, packing it into our cells, and then evolving it over time. And so with this, we're gonna close out our session. Thank you, thank you so much for coming. Please leave us comments in the comment box. You will see um, that there is a feedback link and we will really appreciate any feedback that you have for us. Also, if you wanna hear more Crick Scientists talk, um, we have a session tomorrow um, on COVID. So please, please, again, I think the link should be in the comment box. So. Please attend that too. And thank you everyone for turning out. I hope you've learned a lot about DNA tonight. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. We'll see you later.